Good morning. In the mid-1980s, when I was in the process of forming my own identity, almost every day I walked past this imposing artwork by Colin McCann. It used to hang in the McLaren building at Victoria University, and now it can be found in, the Rutherford, in Rutherford House. It's a landscape overwritten with biblical text from Isaiah and Jeremiah of the Old Testament. But the dominant text, or image, is, or both, is the massive I am. This text is a fundamental assertion of selfhood, of identity. Clipped from its original New Testament context, I am the truth, the way and the light, I am the resurrection, it appears as an existential cri de coeur, a statement of individuation and differentiation from the crowd, a call to be noticed, to be taken account of. I thought I'd take it as a bit of a theme for my introductory comments to this conference, fitting because Victoria University is one of the three organisers of this event, and Victoria owns this painting. Uh, together, sorry, Victoria, together with my office and the Department of Internal Affairs. And it's also fitting because of the venue, Te Papa, which is the keeper of our cultural identity, as Miriam mentioned. This impulse to assert and differentiate oneself is a feature of at the very earliest artistic endeavours produced by our species, and perhaps one of the features that differentiates us from other species. This is a stencil of a hand from the Guaham Cave in Borneo. It's around 40,000 years old. Could this be the first biometric? a Mesolithic biometric. A sense of identity is something about our innate humanity. It is irrevocably bound to other fundamental characteristics of humanity, of dignity, autonomy. Today, like everybody else here, I'm going to talk about identity. What is it? How does it form? How is it assigned? Can it change? How do institutions respond to assertions of identity? Although assertions of identity are as old as humanity, the concept of identity is changing. I want to look at some of those changes and their implications. I hope to explore the dichotomy between the need for some actors in society and the economy to be able to rely on a trusted and verified assertion of objective identity of the individuals with whom they are interacting, and the desire for others to preserve their autonomy by going about their business unidentified and unobserved without any assertions of identity. I want to consider the phenomenon of identity as an, as an accretion of records, to look at the means by which we identify individuals or de-identify data sets, these kind of ideas that the Deputy Prime Minister just touched on. To the beginning, then. Identity means different things to different people, different disciplines. A philosopher, a psychologist, a political science, a database controller, and a regulator will all have quite different but equally legitimate understandings of the term. Descartes, for example, in his famous proclamation, cogito ergo sum, or I think, therefore I am, meant something quite different from his I am than did McCann. Psychological constructs give us the origin of the word. Identity is the entity which contains the id, the personality structure that contains a human's basic instinctual drives. We've seen a lot in popular discourse lately about gender identity. When I was at universities, uh, sorry, when I was at university, the academic journals were full of hand-wringing dissertations on whether New Zealand could be said to have a distinct national or cultural identity. Is identity subjective, how we feel about ourselves, or is it objective, how and who we are observed to be? What happens when we decide that identity is or can only be one of these? A new addition to the lexicography is identity theft. The greater the confidence institutions have in the reliability of their system of identity and identification, the more devastating the consequences of identity theft. The less a business or organisation requires us to to do to prove or verify or authenticate our identity, the more vulnerable we are to having someone else impersonate us, acquire some advantage based on that misidentification, and leave us tainted and burdened by the interloper's mischief. We need strong and reliable means of, and secure means of demonstrating our identity to avoid these taints and burdens. 
Let's go back to that great biblical Cartesian artistic assertion, I am. In one sense, we might consider the, our identity, the I, to be a combination of actions and memories, the I am. First comes the impulse from that Mesolithic artist who stood in the cave in Borneo and said in a moment of impulse, I will make my mark. Second, the action, red ochre blown across his hand onto the wall. Third, the memory held by the space, the actual physical mark left on the wall. Those three things, the impulse and the action and the memory of that action, could be said to make up identity. And identity is therefore a very particular statement. I am here and this is me. The world into which that statement is made has changed utterly. In 2015, when you're seized by a notion to say, I am here, you can write a book, post a blog, write a song. A moment of impulse can produce a tweet, a Snapchat, YouTube video or comment, Instagram, Facebook, Vine. But those impulses giving rise, giving rise to actions endure. They become part of the collective memory of who and what you are. They become your identity. Of course, you don't need to tweet or post comments online or click a like button. But even if we do none of those things, we are every moment recording our actions in a way that has never occurred before. Our location is known not just by the phone we carry with us and the network provider, who, by the way, requires evidence of identity before issuing a SIM card to us, but increasingly a range of other sensors and devices in our cars, on our computers, on our wrists, in our credit cards and the labels of our clothes. All of these contribute to our, our, identity as, our identity as perceived by that telecommunications carrier, web platform, credit card company, or government agency. This is not necessarily happening in a particularly sinister way. Most of the time, these watchers don't care too much who you really are. What they really care about is a person-shaped someone who looks like you. The watchers are more often not even human, just algorithmic suckers and aggregators of data linked by assumed unique features, which are constant, a name, an IP address, a telephone number. They do this because when they have enough information, they can be reasonably sure that a person-shaped someone will also act like you. And that knowledge is worth money. If you're, not a, sorry, if you're a business and it's worthwhile, and if you're the government because knowing your population means you are better at helping them or doing whatever else you decide you need to do. There's a constant evolutionary pressure for both business and government to get better and more information about what people have done and what they are and who they are to read the traces of action and collate the memories that people have left about themselves. And inevitably, it seems to me, as the data banks grow and join up, the person-shaped block of data that looks like you will come to resemble and be relied upon as if it were an exact portrait of you that is indistinguishable from you, the person. Jorge Luis Borges once wrote a story about a gigantic map. This map grew and kept growing along with the ever-expanding desire of its cartographers to accurately represent the space it depicted, and eventually the map was exactly the same size as the country it described, point for point, hundreds of miles across. Naturally, the map was completely and utterly useless. The story ends with the map being left to rot. There is a parallel with the endlessly detailed digital portraits that the world is painting of each of us, but the decaying part is not going to happen. With big data, we have conquered space when it comes to data storage. Moore's law that postulates exponential growth of computing power over time is well known. What's equally important is Crider's law, which suggests that a similar growth, suggests a similar growth in storage capacity and drop in storage costs. The gigabyte that cost a few hundred thousand dollars in 1980 cost a few cents now. We are always going to have more space to store data and cheaper space to store data, and we are always going to have more memory. So we have conquered memory, and therefore, with our machines, we have conquered forgetting. As Bruce Schneier suggested, we are embarking on a great experiment of never forgetting. These objectively observed actions and memories, these digital traces that are aggregated to give what Europeans call the data controller a version of your identity that can be misleading. We have less control than at any time in history over what facts are recorded and aggregated to make up what others take to be our identity. We have created machines that are so much better than us at remembering that we threaten to make any subjective notion of identity obsolete. 
all can be tabulated by observing our actions as we move through the world. To get a feeling for the nature and pace of change, think back to your own infancy. I know that's a big ask. A baby is born, consists of maybe name, sex, date of birth, weight. That's pretty much all you can say about a baby, and that information is passed among friends like it's precious because of that. But from birth, little stories start happening, and we in turn record those. I don't know about you, but I don't believe I could easily lay hands on a single photograph of myself up to the age of five. I have one or two photographs of my mother as a child and one or two of her mother as a child around the turn of last century. By comparison, a modern parent with a smartphone and a fast finger on the shutter button might have 15,000 photos of their child by the time they are ready to go to school. But it's not just the number of photos, it's their nature and location. They are digital, and many will be stored in the cloud. If just one of those is tagged with a name, very soon the capacity will exist for all of those to be linked together by facial recognition software and connected with a vast array of other data points to give a rich and diverse longitudinal record of that child's identity into adulthood and forevermore. Add to that the hundreds of thousands of data points collected and retained by government, business and social networks. When a 21st century baby is all grown up, he or she will have a life that has been recorded, scanned, and meticulously curated by careful machines. They'll have a fantastically intricate, logged, searchable external record of their identity to go with their internal sense of self, and there will be some value in that. Perhaps we'll see an increasing demand, however, for a right to be forgotten, or the right to oblivion, as the French so cheerfully call it. Such a right could more tightly regulate the circumstances in which agencies must delete or delink personal information. We might at least see a right to take the data with you when you leave a particular platform. We might see people taking greater steps to reduce the amount of data that can be attached to their identity. Might we all start conducting our online interactions using anonymizing Tor browsers? We've seen an enormous appetite for WhatsApp with its confidential messaging service protected by end-to-end -end encryption enjoying phenomenal growth. In April this year, they hit a record of 800 million monthly active users. Is guaranteed anonymity online the answer or even a social good? Plato's famous and mythical ring of gidges made the wearer invisible granting them the power to do whatever they wanted without consequence and in the story, the ring transformed the wearer into a sociopath. I've seen the same phenomenon on Twitter and in ask.fm. Bullying, abusive behaviors shielded by anonymity and then the almost equally obnoxious doxing, revealing the identity of others who are trying in vain to maintain their anonymity online. Or perhaps we will see a change in societal and cultural values that will see the next generation being more tolerant of the universally known more forgiving of the still recorded but now irrelevant historical indiscretion. Perhaps it will be those who take steps to minimize their digital footprint to opt out of the endlessly enumerated identity who will arouse suspicion. We already regard those who insist on using cash in this increasingly electronic economy as anomalous anachronisms, even to the extent that anti-money laundering laws assume a presumption of criminality for those whose mistrust of banks leads them to do their business with wads of notes. We are already seeing companies betting the farm on, market, on the market appetite for the quantification of the self. These devices that record your workout, heart rate, food intake, blood pressure and the like but there is also a risk that conflating observable objective characteristics and actions with identity can reduce that space for self-identification, for individuation. An imposed identity denies self-identification, denies nuance and context and undermines dignity. Its extreme denies humanity. Who and what you think you are means nothing. We have decided you are the sum of your online interactions or purchases or contacts or your religion. Here, we see the ultimate in individual identity at once denied and bureaucratic identity imposed, the dehumanizing just a number. Don't just tick Godwin's law on your privacy bingo card. 
Although we have almost become inured to these kind of images today, and it is easy to consider them hyperbole when invoked in any discussion about where things might end, it is impossible to understand the prescriptive, rights-based Western European approach to data protection and privacy without understanding the crucible from which the modern human rights instruments were formed. An official, sanctioned, assigned, or mandated, or even commercially monopolistic identity can become a trap which limits one's economic or social participation. How does an individual assert an identity which is at variance with the official or even commercial record? The French equivalent of my office, the Commission Nationale Informatique et Liberté, was it created in 1978 after a proposal known as Safari caused great consternation in France. The proposal was to identify each citizen with a unique number and use that number to interconnect all government records. The plan was scrapped, leaving only the Keneal to watch out for people's liberties and a brand name that Apple could grab for its browser 30 years later. Now many of those liberties are up for grabs again in France as legislators there struggle to address homegrown terrorism in the wake of the Charlie Hebdo attacks. Similarly here, access to identity documents and the connectedness of government information systems is under scrutiny after convicted, convicted murderer and child rapist Philip Smith slash trainer managed to get a passport and leave the country while on short release from prison. There is an inquiry underway in relation to that, so I won't speculate on the issues confronting the inquirers or their possible recommendations in response, but it is hard to imagine the process by which passports are available to inmates will be loosened as a result. Does that mean it will be more difficult for all of us? Will there be a check to see whether I or someone who looks like me is serving a jail term next time I need to apply to renew my passport to urgently travel? I should say, by the way, um, in terms of identity confusion, for a time the uh, top search item on Google when you hit John Edwards was a New York Times headline which said, is John Edwards the most reviled man in America? Passports might become more difficult to get for some as a result of the inquiry, and we've already seen, we've already increased the circumstances in which the passport, that most definitive identity document, can be cancelled where a minister thinks the holder might be involved in foreign jihad. The pressures on identity assertion, verification, and authentication are myriad, and not just as a result of technology, as we've seen. Domestic policy priorities, global geopolitics can affect how we in New Zealand see our rights and liberties. Now that we have a more comprehensive than ever aggregation of supposedly objective data of proven evidence of our interactions in the world, is there a risk that our level of confidence in that third party, of a, um, third party assignment of identity will go beyond what is justified? Will we crowd out any capacity for the subjective assertion of self? We've already seen this in a number of institutions in relation to gender identity. An inability of rigid bureaucracies to accommodate the difference between the observed, supposedly objective characteristics of an individual and that individual's subjective experience and sense of identity. This inflexibility can cause exclusion and significant distress. Note the title of this report, uh, produced by the Human Rights Commission a few years ago, uh, on discrimination experienced by transgender people. To be who I am. As I discussed earlier, one of the great anchors of official identity is evidence of birth. The date, the parents, the place, the name given to the child recorded in an official incontestable register and certificate. Could it be wrong? Can a date of birth change? I'm in the process of investigating a case in point at the moment. I haven't concluded that investigation, so I need to slightly obscure some facts and not identify the parties involved. But imagine this scenario. A refugee arrives in New Zealand from a failed state without evidence of identity. Anyone who has worked with refugees knows that this is not an uncommon phenomenon. Family members attempt to procure documentation to satisfy New Zealand authorities and later produce from the refugee's village a statement from the village authority that a person with the name of that name was born in that village on a specified date. That document is taken as the official record of identity and the age of the refugee is recorded as 15. But he is quite big. Doubts grow. He feels older, is out of sync with those his offi that, that officials have deemed to be his peers. 
Medical examiners test and conclude he must be at least three years older. Bone density scans support that judgment. A visit back to the village suggests an error might have been made. The individual's self-identity is that of a maturing adolescent ready for social and economic interactions which are denied him because of his recorded age. His self-identification, supported by extrinsic medical evidence, is that he is of an age which he is entitled to receive certain benefits, enrol in certain educational programs, enjoy a range of other rights, entitlements and privileges which are denied to him based on the official and officially accepted version of his, of his identity. Which identity should prevail? When we speak of identity, it is assumed that we are speaking of information associated with identifiers. The Privacy Act, for example, is concerned only about information about an identifiable individual. An identifier is a name or unique combination of data elements that allows us to connect an individual with a set of data. As we rush to embrace the undeniable benefits of big data and, the en and enhanced analytics, we do need to pause from time to time and contemplate identity. Does stripping name, date of birth, and address out of a data set effectively de-identify it? Perhaps not. Scott Peppert, professor of law at Colorado School of Law, wrote in a 2014 paper on the Internet of Things that researchers at MIT recently analyzed data on 1.5 million cell phone users in Europe over 15 months and found that it was relatively easy to extract complete location information about a single person from an, anon from an anonymized data set containing more than a million people. In a stunning illustration of the problem, they showed that to do so required only locating that single user within several hundred yards of a cell phone transmitter sometime over the course of an hour, four times in one year. With four such known data points, the researchers could identify 95% of the users in the data set. As one commentator on this landmark study put it, for sensor-based data sets, it's very hard to, produce, uh, to preserve anonymity. Think about that. If I know where you live and where you work, and make a couple of educated guesses about where else you might have been in a year. Everyone comes to Te Papa once a year, right? To a gas station somewhere close to your house. I can have your precise details of your movements over a whole year extracted from that supposedly anonymized data set. The other famous example is Latanya Sweeney's from as far back as the mid-1990s. I've used this story before, so forgive me if you've already heard it. The Massachusetts Group Insurance Commission decided to release anonymized health data on state employees. Its aim was to help researchers improve health care. Obvious identifiers such as name, address, and social security number were removed from the data. The Massachusetts governor at the time, William Weld, assured the public that the Group Insurance Commission had protected patient privacy by deleting identifiers. A graduate student in computer science at MIT at the time, Latanya Sweeney, requested a copy of the data and got to work. She knew that Governor Weld resided in Cambridge, Massachusetts, a city of 54,000 residents and seven zip codes. For $20, she purchased the complete electoral rolls for Cambridge. These included the name, address, zip code, birth date, and sex of every voter. Only six people in Cambridge shared Governor Weld's birth date. Only three of those six were men, and of them, only he lived in his zip code. Dr. Sweeney had the governor's detailed health records, including diagnoses, prescriptions, and details of hospital visits delivered to his office. Dr. Sweeney has continued to research in this area and re has revealed that our intuitive beliefs about how easy it is to identify an individual from a supposedly anonymous set of data are often misplaced. Among her findings, she has demonstrated that 87% of the US population can be identified by birth date, sex, and zip code alone. This is particularly startling when you keep in mind that the average zip code has a population of around 7,500. To put that in a New Zealand context, the average population of a statistics New Zealand mesh block is about 90. For the next largest statistical unit, the area unit, the average population is 2,100. As more data sets are linked together, there are an increased number of vectors for identifying a target. So while you might not have information about a target's birthday, you might know what they studied at university, or how many children they have, or whether they've ever been convicted of an offence. As well as the risk to individuals, the ability to identify individuals within a large data set can jeopardise the data set's objectives. This is a feature of last year's debates in the UK over the government's decision to make detailed NHS data available to researchers through its care.data initiative. 
Privacy campaigners pointed out that where the details of treatments were in the public domain, such as then Labour leader uh, Ed Miliband's nose operation to cure sleep apnea, or then Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg's wife's broken elbow, it will be possible to identify the individual and read across their broader NHS record. Well-known medical science commentator and advocate for greater use of data in public policy, Ben Goldacre, summed it up in The Guardian with the title, Care.data is in chaos. It breaks my heart. As he put it, when you're proposing to share our most private medical records, vague promises and an imaginary regulatory framework are not reassuring. The public outcry forced the government to delay the launch of Care.data. An online tool developed by a private company has already been shut down and there's been a parliamentary select committee inquiry. There are new ways of identifying people that are still being identified. It's only relatively recently that it was discovered that each person has a unique gait. It's not the one you go through to your house, it's the way you walk. Back to Scott Peppert. This means that if I knew something about an individual Fitbit user's gait or style of walking, I could use that information to identify that individual among the millions of anonymized Fitbit users' data. I would then have access to all that user's other Fitbit data, which would now be reassociated with her. As Ira Hunt, Chief Technology Officer of the Central Intelligence Agency, put it, Simply by looking at the data from a Fitbit, we can find out with pretty good accuracy what your gender is, whether you're tall or short, whether you're heavy or light, and you can be 100% identified by simply your gait, how you walk. These examples illustrate why we need to take care over concepts of identification and de-identification, and why we, while acknowledging the inevitability and desirability of, desiring, of deriving value from public data sets, have been very supportive of the Data Future Forum process and its cautious and orderly recommendations for the oversight of innovative use of supposedly anonymised data. We are in increasingly seeing tensions between what individuals want of their online environment and what the online environment seems to demand of them. A dichotomy is developing between individual consumers and citizens' desires to transact safely and have the means of asserting a trusted and authenticated identity and their ability to move through the online world anonymously, unobserved, and without contributing to the aggregating avatar, the digital doppelganger that with every mouse click presumes to know more about ourselves than we do. Even when what we are seeing is the operation of an algorithm completely unmoderated by human judgment that makes assumptions about who we are, or perhaps precisely because it is an automated process, presuming to draw its own conclusions about identity, we can be diminished by that presumption. The Target example springs to mind. You will have heard the story from the New York Times in 2012. An analyst at Target was looking at the purchasing history of women on the Target baby registry. He found that around about the beginning of the second trimester, a lot of the women started buying unscented lotions. If you combine that with all the purchases, with, with purchases within the first 20 weeks of supplements like calcium, magnesium and zinc, you were pretty sure to be able to begin marketing baby products to women quite early in their pregnancy. Here's what happened next. An angry man went into a Target outside of Minneapolis demanding to talk to the manager. My daughter got this in the email, in, in, in the mail, he said. She's still in high school and you're sending her coupons for baby clothes and cribs. Are you trying to encourage her to get pregnant? The manager didn't have any idea what the man was talking about. He looked at the mailer. Sure enough, it was addressed to the man's daughter and contained advertisements for maternity clothing, nursery furniture, and pictures of smiling infants. The manager apologized and called a few days later to apologize again. On the phone, though, the father was somewhat abashed. I had a talk with my daughter, he said. Turns out there's been some activities in my house I hadn't been completely aware of. She, she's due in August. I owe you an apology. Now, what gets me about that story, if it's true, was that the father in that scenario felt that he owed Target an apology. I want to finish with another slide uh, of a McCann painting on the same theme as the one I started with. This one is called Victory Over Death 2. We see the same bold statement of identity, I am. But look to the left third of the canvas. There is a blackness, a void in what is otherwise a fully utilized space. 
If you look closely, you can make out that the artist has painted over what was there before. There was a large AM, a large AM, now obliterated with black. That confident, positive assertion, I am, once was inverted to the more tentative, doubtful, am I? The artist knows that our sense of identity can be fleeting and fragile, and that at different times we don't even know ourselves who we are. Doubt and tenuous, tenuousness is part of the human condition. Identity is mutable and fluid. As Privacy Commissioner, I'm interested in, in watching where today and tomorrow's discussion goes and how we here in New Zealand will respond to the challenges faced by many countries in an uncertain geopolitical climate with tremendous advances in technology and data collection. I'll advocate for privacy by design, which will be covered at a session later today, for a proportional response to emerging threats, a desire which I am sure is shared by the Director of the Security Intelligence Service, who will also speak later in the afternoon. I'll argue that we should, we should resist authentication inflation, and to the greatest extent possible that we should be able to go, out our, go about our business in the world and online anonymously if we wish, and that we should not arouse suspicion if we do. I'll support initiatives like RealMe, the government identity service operated by New Zealand Post that can allow users to access a wide range of services without tracking them across them. With a reform of the Privacy Act coming up, I'm keen on having a conversation about a right to be anonymous or pseudonymous to the greatest extent possible and what that might look like. I'm keen on looking at a prohibition on re-identification of data from supposedly de-identified data sets. But on a day-to-day -day basis, how do you and I respond to these increasingly externally applied identities? How do we preserve dignity and autonomy in the face of these ever-confident coders and engineers? Maybe we just need to introduce doubt into their systems. Maybe when confronted by the certainty of their algorithmic, ass algorithmic assessment of our identity, when some enterprise makes assertions, you are John Edwards, you are a male, atheist, Wellingtonian, father, partner, lawyer, Pakiha, heterosexual, downloader of Game of Thrones. <laughs> Perhaps the best response is simply to cross one's arms, lean back a little, draw a breath, nod, and say, am I? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John, for a very interesting uh, speech. Who would like to uh, ask a question? I drafted my speech in a way that didn't really <laughs> invite questions. Yes, there is a question over there. There is one. Yeah. John, um, with um, government services moving online more and more, um, what sort of information do you think that agencies should move towards sharing um, to prevent identity fraud or misuse of identity? Um, well, there's the what and the how. Uh, I think agencies are entitled, well, and, and I guess you know the only answer you're going to get from me uh, on such a specific question about uh, covering a range of topics is, is it depends. You know, what is the uh, level of identity threat presented by the service that you're offering? Uh, what is the commensurate level of certainty you need to establish the identity in order to provide that service? And we've seen this work uh, carried out by the Department of Internal Affairs over many years, the evidence of identity standard and so on. Um, when I've talked about um, uh, trying to avoid uh, authentication inflation. It is that point that um, you know, if all you're doing is delivering somebody uh, forms on which to fill out, uh, to, to make an application for something, they don't need to authenticate. They don't need to offer their evidence of identity. But you know, those are enterprise decisions for each business to make. Um, the kind of connection that the, um, the minister was talking about this morning uh, that will allow the sharing of information 
about people that we know to be the same across departments, I don't think requires the collection of any extra information. Uh, when we do business with the Inland Revenue Department or the Ministry of Social Development or the Department of Internal Affairs for, to access particular benefits, I think there is a standardisation about the level of authentication that we are required to reach. The, what what uh, we don't yet have, I think, is a means of readily connecting those across agencies, and um, I, at this stage, uh, am quite supportive of that. Um, I think, as the Minister said, if we can make the business case that there is value in uh, allowing uh, a greater level of sharing, then you make that business case and allow people to opt in, and I think that you, know, you will see that. Um, uh, do, do you want to elaborate on your question any further? Do you have a particular... Um, it was just more, I suppose, in terms of um, the digital environment and, I suppose, the traditional identifiers that we've collected in the past yeah. are changing. That's right. I mean, when I said that there's the what and then there's, there's, there's the how, but one of the questions you need to consider when designing your business processes is, OK, I need to uh, satisfy myself that this is John Edwards that I'm dealing with. How do I do that? You can access an, an evidence of identity, a passport or a driver's licence. Do you need actually to record that in your system? You know, once you have satisfied yourself that the person has reached the threshold you've set, um, what, what shadow or record do you need to create of that? These are, I think, important questions. And I guess you know, I uh, default to the minimum, uh, what is necessary to achieve your objective, and to the proportional. Uh, how what is the least that people need to do in order to access a service? I mean, if you think about um, accessing health services, these are uh, heavily subsidised by the government or fully funded in many cases, uh, and there is a legitimate need, or legitimate business case for, uh, for, for um, the providers of health services to require some evidence of identity and eligibility, undoubtedly. But uh, you see those services designing their um, their authentication systems or, or service provision models based on the expectations of consumers who access those services and the wider public good. So, for example, sexual health services will never require um, uh, evidence of identity and they don't um, uh, assign NHI numbers to people. So you can access certain services quite anonymously or pseudonymously and you can and be, uh, not be tracked. So I think the great temptation to sort of have a uniform and universal answer for these things is one that we need to resist. And uh, while we need to accommodate the kind of business efficiencies that the Minister was describing, uh, we also need to think about what is it that we need in order to deliver this particular service to this individual. John, I was just wondering whether you might be able to elaborate a little on your thinking around uh, possible prohibitions on re-identification. Uh, I guess that's fairly emerging thinking both here and internationally, uh, and I think it's going to be very important for all of us as, as we go forward. Thanks. I mean, we, when I have talked about um, the use of administrative data sets for, to inform policy analysis or to, um, for the benefit of the wider economy to inform the private uh, sector actors, for example, or to provide contestable uh, policy advice. I've said um, not only is it possible under the existing regulatory settings, that I think you know, we, we expect it. It's desirable. It's necessary. You expect government to make the best use of that data. It is an, it's a public asset and left uh, un... Uh, you know, untapped as an asset, you know, I think is irresponsible. Having said that, some of the challenges that I described uh, are things that we don't even know. You know, we, we, are, we are at the really at the beginning of uh, the capability of big data. So, I mean, who knew that, for example, the way you walk, uh, you know, the particular, a bunch of particular data points around that could, in fact, be an identifier that would allow the extraction of all data associated with uh, the identity, who is that person who was walking at that time. So I guess if we are to have this kind of social licence or social contract which says, yes, take, a, take these enormous data sets from, uh, from a telecommunications company and from a 
government agency that is providing a service, an education provider or, and or a collector of revenue or the payer of benefits. Let's see what is happening. Let's see how effective government policies are being. Let's see what's happening to the population and to the community. There is a clear and uh, undeniable case uh, for that. But if that is on the basis that uh, the analysis, because it's for an entirely new purpose, will be uh, anonymised, what do we do to ensure that that remains the case? And I think there are technical uh, solutions in that, but as we keep adding data sets in a small population, uh, the likelihood of being able to sort of triangulate individuals increases, and the temptation to do so increases. Uh, so, uh, you know, one of the tools by which we might um, reinforce that social license or social contract uh, is to say uh, the t the condition on which that analysis, that aggregation is allowed is a prohibition on actually trying to reverse engineer the de-identification process. So we're talking with um, officials about some of these ideas. And, you know, uh, you're right to say it's, um, it's at the forefront of uh, conversations around the world, um, but we are not the only one having that conversation. Uh, it's, it's a live issue in Europe and in many other places. Any other questions? In the back? A lot of the paranoia about privacy seems to be driven by popular culture. Does popular culture follow the paranoia or is the paranoia true, in your view? Um, should should hmm. we be afraid? Well, there is the old saying, um, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. Um, there, there's a really interesting uh, interrelationship. If people feel they are being observed, and there's a lot of research on this, uh, if people feel they are being re uh, observed, uh, it can have a really uh, upsetting effect on their quality of life. Um, so... You know, when we saw the, um, the Snowden revelations in 2013, the public discussion and concern from that flowed through the public mood. Um, and in our survey undertaken at the beginning of 2014, we found something like, oh, I can't remember, about half of the population, of the surveyed population, were worried that they had been the target of, or could be the target of, surveillance by the... NSA. Uh, Rebecca Kitteridge, director of the SIS, will be speaking here this afternoon, uh, also undertook uh, a survey and found that 30% of the population believe they may be um, of interest to the SIS. I can tell you with, um, I hope, some confidence, I hope it's not false confidence, but um, those figures are wildly inaccurate. Uh, the, those agencies are simply not that interested in um, and what you know, this side of the room is <laughs> is doing. Um, but the fact that those concerns are there affects people's behaviour and sense of well-being. So, to a certain, and, and that may affect the way they act online. I mean, I mentioned the phenomenal growth of WhatsApp. One of the factors I think which contributes to that growth is that it's one of the most easily accessible end-to-end -end encrypted messaging services. Um, and we've seen a, 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 an increase in demand for better levels of security in the wake not only of uh, uh, allegations from Snowden about the activities of the NSA, but also um, significant data breaches such as the Sony, uh, Apple, various others have, um, uh, have, have uh, breached the trust uh, which consumers have placed in them. So I do think that um, in some cases perception is reality. Um, and what we... You know, to get the most out of this incredible, rich digital environment that's, that's promised us, we must have trust and confidence, or people won't use these systems. Uh, and you know, the kind of paranoia that you describe undermines that trust and confidence. We have room for one more question, yes? In other jurisdictions, uh, such as Australia, and it's proposed in the UK, uh, there's measures for government retention of data based on our 
web browsing and so on. How do you think that kind of legislative context would change the way in which we're talking about some of those issues here in New Zealand? Uh, you mean were New Zealand to legislate for mandatory retention periods? Um, well, it would probably uh, bring to the fore a conversation about things that are happening already. I mean, the fact that we haven't got mandatory retention periods to me suggests that um, the business retention, you know, the, the periods of retention for um, business imperatives um, actually align in New Zealand, align with the needs of agencies which might need to access them. Um, I don't know what has driven the need to legislate uh, for the retention periods um, in those other jurisdictions, but um, but I would say you know we, we've seen a willingness of law enforcement, of security and intelligence agencies, to go to government and uh, and and make the case when they believe their powers have fallen behind technological capacity. So the fact that we haven't seen those, uh, I suspect, uh, tells us that um, it's okay with them already. So maybe that's a conversation that uh, you, you might want to take up with the telcos and the intelligence agencies, Andrew. <laughs>